Welcome to Thoughts Roundup. So nice to be back with you. I would like to talk about today Reverend G.A. Mangan. And I'd like to tell you about my pastor. Brother Mangan, as many people know, was such a such a great man. Brother Mangan uh, was originally from Plymouth, Indiana, and I preached in the church that he was from. Uh, I knew his stepmother that I had heard him preach about so much and how great she was, and uh, I knew her. The first time I saw Brother Mannion, he was young, and it was before he married uh, Sister Mannion, and uh, he was at our old country church out in, they called it Camp 8, and he was preaching a revival. And oh, he was dressed in that slick back black hair. And what I remember about, I, re, I remember, I remember a little bit about what he, what he preached. And uh, but, and I was just a boy. But I also remember some of us boys had a a green frog hemmed up outside just below the church steps and Brother Mangan came out and he was fascinated with that frog and it meant to, a lot to us boys that he cared about something that that we cared about and uh, but I'm going to tell you Brother Mangan was such a great preacher uh, now that was at home. Uh, Brother Mangan preached. He had opportunities to, to preach all over the world, but uh, he didn't want to go anywhere. He wanted to. He wanted to preach at home, and he didn't preach as good when he was away from home because, well, all he preached about was Alexandria. Alexandria was. It, it was everything. And uh, well, he just didn't have time to go and preach camp meetings and conferences and all that because he had church going on in Alexandria and Alexandria was it. In fact, he, they got him to go on a mission trip to Lebanon and I believe that's where it was, Lebanon. And they all got over there and uh, everything was closed, even though it was early. Everything was closed. No restaurants open, no place to get anything. It's all closed. Brother Mayan said, well, I can tell you what's wrong. It's Thursday night. Well, I said, Brother Mayan, why you say it's Thursday night? He said, because... Everything closes early in Alexandria on Thursday night. He, he never could get away from, he thought the whole world pivoted around Alexandria. And uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was a great person. Uh, he, he was kind of, in one sense of the word, to a younger person and all, he was kind of untouchable. Uh, and, and of course, we admired him so much until we stood in awe of him. And if he spoke to us along the, uh, in the aisles, we counted it as an honor. Well, whenever I got in the church, 
I'd come home from the Navy and just really got settled in the church real good. Moved from our little country church in Alexandria to work. And I was in the church and we was having, we'd had revival and everything, verbal being was there, had been preaching there. The glory of the Lord was falling and I, I, I was just, all I had to do to get blessed was just walk in. I didn't have to do much of anything. I just feel the presence of God coming down and I would get so happy and cry and laugh and, and shout around and I just enjoyed. Just, it was just, just the Holy Ghost move and Alexandria was a bigger church than what I was used to and they had Sister Mangan singing, and then they had a choir, and it was just all so great. And uh, then all of a sudden, I it, I got to where I didn't. I went to church one night, and I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything, and everybody was having such a wonderful time. The revival was going big. It was just so marvelous. And everybody was so happy, and I didn't feel anything. Well, it scared me. It frightened me that I didn't feel anything because I'd always felt the presence of the Lord when I came. Everything was so so wonderful and so new. And so the next day, I had kind of a rough day at work. Uh, I was driving a big laundry tr truck out to Fort Polk. And whenever I come back in that night, I was so worried that I, because I didn't feel the presence of the Lord, and I just wondered. And uh, I got in and to the church, and I still did not feel the presence of the Lord. So I started, I started praying the next day and I prayed all day every minute that, that I could pray I prayed I got in that night and I was hoping for the, a move of God in my heart and I came in and it was worse it was worse everybody's excited and shouting and happy and I was feeling absolutely nothing and you didn't just, uh, maybe you could have, but I I didn't just run up to Brother Mangan. I, I didn't know how to approach Brother Mangan. And, but I saw him when the service was, altar service was beginning and everybody was going up to the altar. I saw that he had gone back to, back to the his office. So I was so upset, I turned and ran back to the office. And when I got back in there, I said, Brother Man, he said, what? I said, I can't feel the presence of God. He looked at me and said, how long has it been? And I said, three nights. He looked at me and stuck out his chin just like only he could do. And he said, you let me tell you something, boy. I came in for him to tell me something, but I got quickly feeling like maybe I was in the wrong office. And he said, God has been good to you. He said, he's blessed you. All you have to do is walk in here and get blessed. He's blessed you in so many ways. And he went to Calvary for you and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you get you a handful of tracks. And you get out and hit those streets. And if you never feel the presence of God, he's done enough for you. And don't you let me hear any more about it. Well, I... I went out, <laughs> and I went out. I remember where I went. I went behind 
There's some old air-conditioned duct work back close to the men's prayer room back behind the auditorium. And I've been over that old duct work and I told the Lord, Lord, if you don't ever bless me again, I'm going to live for you. And it, it was a year. I went one solid year. It was almost like God was saying, okay, I've blessed you. I've died for you. I've coddled you. I've blessed you when you didn't deserve it. But now, I want to see if you're going to live for me now. <laughs> Man, I want to tell you, what if I hadn't had a pastor like Brother Mannion? At, I remember that night, a year later, when I was sitting back in the back, and it was a dull, dry service. Nobody was being blessed. And all of a sudden, I felt the presence of God hit me in the top of my head and went all the way to the bottom of my feet. And I began to dance in the Spirit. God had let me back to where I could feel his presence. But I always remember that year. I'll always remember it. Well, like I say, Brother Mangan didn't preach out much. In fact, it's not hardly at all. I remember coming by his office one morning and he said, Oh, see, they have just called me from West Virginia and want me to preach the camps there. They had youth camps and camp meetings to preach. And he said, uh, what about you preaching those? I said, well, they hadn't had invited me. And just a little while, he called me in and he said, they want you to come and preach those camps. He just... He had no ego about preaching camps and doing all of that. <laughs> you know, when my wife and I first got married, I brought her to Alexandria. She was from Moline, Illinois. I brought her to Alexandria and was so proud to bring her to my church. And Brother Sister Mangan asked, said, why don't you come go to the fellowship meeting with us? Oh, oh, that was like a trip to the moon today. Yeah, Brother Mangan has asked us to go to the fellowship meeting with him, with them. And he has one of those old, big old rocket, like Oldsmobile. Had all that chrome down the sides. And he drove. Who did he drive? And so when we got, we parked their car at his house and we got in the car with him. And all of a sudden there was a dog on the street. And uh, <laughs> he started making a dart for that dog and going straight towards the curb. And he missed him and so... The dog turned and come back up the street. He turned around in the driveway, come back and tried to run over the dog again. And man, we was just so afraid he was going to run over him. And that, that's what he was trying to do. And finally the dog got completely out of the way and was gone. And he said, that dog is driving me crazy. And I, I saw another side. <laughs> How daring he, uh, he was. You, you know, I, uh, Brother Anthony Mang and his son, he said that he did, Brother G.A. Mangan didn't play golf, he didn't fish, he didn't hunt. All he wanted to do was fly an airplane. And he got him an airplane. And the airplane that he had got, bought, and every chance he got, he would fly around if it was nothing just around town, just over town and stuff. He would fly here and there. Brother Anthony still has that airplane. In fact, G. 
just lately here someone has tried to buy it. It's a it's a prized possession uh, for uh, that model. Uh, Brother Mangan, I suppose you folks can tell. I think an awful lot. I thought a lot of my pastor. In fact, I came in, I was pastoring a church in uh, Hodge, Louisiana, and I came in because, to the Alexandria because there was a big uh, meeting going on there, and I had politicians that had come from Baton Rouge and big shots everywhere, and they was having a special service. And, I walked in and they said, Brother Marler, come on up to the platform. I walked on up to the platform. They said, have a seat here. And it was Brother Mannion's big chair. I said, no, no, thank you. Oh, go ahead. It's all right. He's doing such and such. I said, oh, no, no. That's the big chair. And I just simply refused to sit in it because that's where the big man sat, in the big chair. And so all the years that I came back to visit, they always made mention, we're not going to try to make you sit in the big chair. Now, if you want to find all of my programs, go to HGR, Holy Ghost Radio, and get on the playlist. Look at the playlist. I think this is about the 22nd one, probably, that I've put on. God bless you. Thank you.